this is Alpha 2, Module 3, Lesson 1. It says the following formula for paper folding were discovered by Brittany Gallivan in 2001 when she was a high school junior. The first formula determines the minimum width, W, of a square piece of paper of thickness, T, needed to fold it in half N times alternating horizontal and vertical folds. The second formula determines the minimum length of a long rectangular piece of paper of thickness T needed to fold it in half N times, always folding perpendicularly to the long side. Number one says, notebook paper is approximately 0 0.004 inches thick. So what is that? Four thousandths inch thick. Using the formula for the width W, determine how wide a square piece of notebook paper would need to be to successfully fold it in half 13 times, alternating horizontal and vertical folds. So what we're looking for is how wide it has to be. Okay? We're looking for how wide it has to be. Everybody good with that? Now, in our formula, we're using W. All we're going to do is plug in black. What do we have to plug in here? All right, 0 0.004 and, and 13. So what, what goes where? T, good. Okay, so W equals pi times... 0 0.004 times 2. Now, that is raised to the 3 times 13 minus 1 over 2 power. Now, there's a lot going on here, but we never leave order of operations. We always follow PEMDAS. So we're going to work with parentheses, exponents, and all the way back down. So let's just rewrite it as W equals pi times 0 0.004 times, and we're going to have 2 times 3 to the 12th over 2. So that would be, I'm just going to, are y'all okay with me just reducing this and saying 3 times 6? Okay, so that's to the 18th now, because that's over 1. All right, so then we would have W equals pi over 0 0.004 times 2 to the 18th, which means you need a calculator, because I'm not about to do that, and you're going to plug that in. So, if we plug in, let's see if I can do it all together, pi times 0.004 times 2 to the 18th, you get 3294.20. Close enough. So that's how wide it would need to be. Now, number two says, toilet paper is approximately two thousandths inch thick. Using the formula for the length L, how long would a continuous sheet of toilet paper have to be to fold it into half 12 times, folding perpendicularly along the long edge each time. So once again, we're just plugging in stuff, okay? We're going to plug in for T, we're going to plug in for N, and just solve it. So you're going to have to get 
So what my uh, issue with the way I teach is, is I teach a concept. And the bad thing about just teaching concepts the way that I do is you don't do enough practice on it to where you're precise in your skills. That would be the downfall of the way I teach. Okay, You need to be working these out as you're watching the videos or as I'm doing them so that you're precise in doing it. Who cares if you know how to do it, but you can't execute it, okay? You can know the theory, you can know the concept, but if you can't execute it using paper and pencil on a calculator, what's it matter? All right? Once again, what does it matter if you can execute it, but you don't know what you're doing? You don't know how to do it. You gotta have a little bit of both. So let's work these out. We're gonna have L equals pi, and T is going to be what was it? 0 0.002 divided by 6 times 2 to the 12th plus 4 times 2 to the 12th minus 1. Okay. That first number is going to be something crazy. But let's just see what 2 to the 12th is right now. 2 to the 12th is 4,096. So 4,096 plus 4 is 4,100. 2 to the 12th is 4,096 minus 1. So that's going to be 4,095. And we would have to plug in pi times 0 0.002. Divided by 6. Ugh. I don't really like that. Um, that's okay, though. L equals 0 0.001047, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So then we would just multiply that by 4100 times 4000. 1095, and you would get the length would have to be 17,581.923. Okay, it's just plugging in stuff. Now, you're saying, well, why is this? We're not doing anything special. We're just plugging in and answering questions, solving formulas. Because what's going to end up happening is, is what if we didn't know that we we're going to fold it in half 12 times? And we were trying to solve for the exponent. That's where you're going to be getting into your logs. Go ahead and go to page 2 of the whiteboard. Right. And it says, use the properties of exponents to rewrite each expression in the form of kx to the nth power. Then evaluate the expression for the given value of x. Okay, so what does that mean? Do we know our k to the x to the n power? So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> All that means is we want to go ahead, since we can multiply those together, what is, we're just looking at this. We need to get it all together in one term. Okay, now we've got it multiplied by each other, which means we have two terms. We want to go ahead and multiply them together and get them in one term. So since it's multiplication, it doesn't matter which way we do it. So two, let's just say two to the five, two times five to the four. X. Now, when we are multiplying exponents, what are we actually doing? When you're multiplying exponents, what are you doing? You just combine them, right? You don't actually multiply them, we combine them. So let's go ahead and say 3 minus 1 is 2. Everybody good with that? Now, can we do 2 times 5 fourths? Can we do that? 
because when you are taking your x cubed and x to the negative 1 and you combine them, you do not multiply them. The only time you multiply exponents are when they are to a power. That's when you're going to multiply. So if you're multiplying terms with exponents, you combine them. Okay. So let's go ahead and do what's 2 to... This almost seems too easy. 2 to the 5 fourths before I mess up here. Yeah. 2 times 5 divided by 4 is 2.5, right? So let's just write that as 5 over 2 x squared. Now it says we have to plug in x equals 2, right? Now we've got it in the simple form, though. Now we can just say 5 over 2 times 2 squared. Well, what's 2 squared? 4. What's 4 times 2 and a half? 10. Right? Or 20 over 2, which is 10. There you go. Now let's look at it. Here's, here's where it can kind of get a little tricky. When you have exponents in the denominator, guys, pay attention. This is where you're, you're going to miss it. I promise. It still gets confusing for me. All right. We've got to get this into one term now. So what we're going to say is, when something, when we have an exponent in the denominator, okay, it is automatically, okay, automatically a negative, okay, when it's in the denominator. If you have a negative exponent in the denominator, okay, it's actually a positive exponent, okay. I know it's confusing, and I'll show you this here in just a second. Okay, So what we want to do, since that exponent is outside of the parentheses, you have to take that and move it to each term inside the parentheses. So now you're going to have 9 over 2 to the negative 3 times x to the negative 3. Okay? Everybody good with that? Yay, nay, no, maybe. Anybody? Now, you're going to just we just distribute this to both terms inside the parentheses. Okay. Now, since those are negative exponents, okay, and they're in the denominator, we can shift those to the top. Okay? So we can rewrite this as 9 times 2 to the 3rd, x to the 3rd. Well, what's 2 to the 3rd power? 8 x cubed. What's 9 times 8? 72 x cubed. Now... We can plug in our x as a negative one third. So what is 72 times a negative one third cubed? Well, 72 times what's one cubed? One. What's three cubed? Nine. And it's still going to be negative. Because it's to an odd power. So if it had been to an even power, it would have been positive. Because you've done a negative times a negative and it's a positive. But now you've done a negative times a negative times a negative, so it stays negative. Now if you do this, what will that be? 1 8? Or not 1 8. 8 over 3? No, that's not right. What are we doing here? 
What is that? That would be eight. Negative eight? What did they do? They done something crazy. I think they missed it. That should be it. All right. Okay.